All right. Um, we have uh, two announcements. Uh, one is that I will be leaving uh, early in the morning to go to, to Arizona to go to Tucson Bible Church, which I do twice a year, where John Hintz is pastor. And I'll be teaching a series. I, th I think this is going to be a lengthy series. I'm going to do it. Th I'm, I'm going to do it at least this time. Just get started, and then in March, and then maybe extending even into next year. Just doing a series, going through key passages on the spiritual life, and working through some of the uh, important connections there. On, on a lot of the basically good key passages. So we'll be doing that, uh, starting that anyway, uh, tomorrow night. And they, they live stream it on, on their Facebook page for Tucson Bible Church for those who uh, want to pay attention to that. And Dr. Wayne House will be here Thursday night to cover uh, for me while I'm gone. And then we'll have our men's prayer breakfast on Saturday morning, uh, November 18th at 7.38. Now, it's not this Saturday, but for those of you who haven't come to the men's prayer breakfast, you probably don't weigh as much as you would if you did come to the men's prayer breakfast. But um, uh, we do have a, a good time of fellowship in the Word as well as, as eating. So those are the announcements. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them by means of truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. So before we get started, we need to make sure we're in right relationship with the Lord. We always have a few moments of silent prayer so that if necessary, we can confess sin and make sure we're walking by the Spirit, and then I will open in prayer. So let's bow our heads together and go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, your grace is beyond measure. Your love for us is beyond our ability to comprehend. And Father, we are thankful for that because that is the basis for our salvation and our walk with you, our spiritual life, our spiritual growth. And Father, we pray that we might not take this lightly and that we might uh, think about the significance and seriousness of your grace in our lives and its impact in everything that we've done in our lives and on into the future for all eternity. Father, we're thankful for your answered prayer, especially as uh, uh, Jim Myers has informed me today that they did get a visa but not in time to depart for today, so they'll be leaving tomorrow. Uh, there have been some other little glitches along the way in terms of emails bouncing and other, other communication problems with uh, people he will be um, um, ministering to in Kenya, and we pray that you would just work out all of those details and smooth out his path uh, for the next uh, three weeks as he is there. Uh, Father, we continue to pray for Israel. We pray for the stamina and the steadfastness. We know that there are many evil, evil forces in this nation that are trying to um, influence this this. Um, this administration away from their support for, for Israel. And we know that those who bless Israel will be blessed, but those who curse Israel will be judged. And Father, we pray that you would just inter intervene and that uh, Christians would make their voices heard, influencing this administration to continue to be steadfast. But Father, with information I learned today, I, we must all realize that our government as as nearly every government in the Middle East and many in Europe has been infiltrated by uh, members of the uh, either those who love Hamas or they are members of, of um, Muslim Brotherhood and other organizations that are truly anti-American, the anti-constitution, anti-Christian, anti-Semitic. And Father, this has been so scary to see what is happening 
uh, in so many of these demonstrations. And we know that, that history is in your hands and that we can trust you and that we are to just relax and go about our mission and not be at all concerned with the distractions that come in the, in, in the political capitals of this world. But we pray for, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for Israel. We pray for our friends and their families, those who are serving in the military for, for their steadfastness, for the courage of those on the war, in the war. Same thing for those in Ukraine and watch over them. And Father, we pray for us tonight that we might be strengthened and encouraged as we study your word, looking at the trends of history that go back to the Tower of Babel, that the human race is set against you. And Father, we are for you, and if uh, you are for us, we know that there's, there's no enemy to fear. And we pray these things down in Christ's name. Amen. I've got two articles. I'm going to read the headlines. I'm not going to read the articles because that would probably, it's bad enough that I'm going to read the headlines to you. Uh, some of you, you know, I get a little irritated with some of my Christian brethren because they listen to what a, a lot of Christian speakers say about what's going on in Israel. It's secondhand information being washed through the, the thinking of other people. And... Um, uh, my wife and I listen to, she listens to all kinds of various uh, um, broadcast Zoom meetings and other things of that nature that are put on by a host of different is Israel, pro-Israel organizations where they have the, some of the top thinkers, the top military men, top politicians getting on, uh, many of their top professors at their top universities who are explaining the history of Israel. And it's better to get it from as much from firsthand information as getting it washed through the grid of other people. There's an article that came out today, one organization that's pretty conservative. I have met on several occasions and heard the, the uh, founder and CEO speak. Uh, it's called The Foundation for Defense of Democracies. And the headline just says it all, Biden enriched Iran by more than $50 billion. Here's how to turn off the spigot. And this article was written by uh, Congressman Darrell, um, I don't know if it's Isa or Isa, Isa from California, and by Richard Goldberg, who is a senior advisor with uh, um, uh, the FDD, Foundation for the Defense of Israel. So that's something you can look up. You can get on their email list, and they'll send you articles every day. Several a day that are great analysis so that you can come to grips with what is going on. And then uh, the other article was from the Daily Telegraph. It is an article written by Ambassador John Bolton. I've had several opportunities to spend with, doc, uh, with Ambassador Bolton. And he just, I'm just going to give you the headline. He said, Israel is running out of time before Biden damns it to defeat. We should be alarmed. The U.S.'s support is rapidly uh, eroding, in part thanks to Iran's propaganda uh, efforts. I listened to one uh, podcast today with an expert. She is an Egyptian expat, and she is an expert on uh, Muslim Brotherhood. And she just, um, if I didn't have the word of God and know that God's in control and God's a protector of Israel, I would just have been scared to death after listening to her today. And she, cha she cited chapter, but she, for every, everything she set forth, she gave the evidence for it. She wasn't just giving opinion. She was giving the evidence for it. And we live in a very dangerous world right now, and we need to be in prayer. We also need to be, as I have said many times, contacting our members of Congress, contacting the White House, because let me tell you, the other side is giving them a tremendous amount of pressure to stop supporting Israel, and we need to continue to let our, our voices be heard. Okay, so that gets our mind off onto the nasty stuff, but we're going to get back into the Word. So we're in continuing the interlocked, where tonight actually we're getting into uh, Lesson 7, Part 2. And the things that we'll uh, focus on in this lesson is the uh, in institution of the fourth and fifth divine institutions that come after the flood. This is the period after the flood. We will finish tonight with uh, going through the first 11 chapters of Genesis, which is the foundation for the rest of the Bible. 
We've had 14 lessons, seven lessons to, or in some cases, three weeks, uh, going through some of these lessons. But we all need to stand up so we can go through uh, all the hand motions and recite the uh, major events going through the Old Testament and New Testament so we can have this framework. We have, I messed, muffed it up last week, but you know, I don't do well with numbers. I can't add one and one and get two more than once a year. And so we, uh, uh, we all make account for that. So we have 12 Old Testament events and 11 New Testament events, a total of 23 events that tell us the story of the Bible. So we have our basic hand motion. So we'll start with the creation then the fall, then the flood, then the Tower of Babel, then the call of Abraham. Then we have the Exodus event, and after the Jews leave Egypt, then they go to Mount Sinai where they're given the Ten Commandments and the entirety of the Mosaic Law. Then they will, after that generation dies off, they will, uh, because of their disobedience, they will enter into the land with the conquest, and then there's the establishment of first the United Kingdom, so we have one crown, and then that is, there's a revolt after Solomon, and so then there's the two crowns and the two kingdoms, and then because of their disobedience, both the kingdoms are exiled and are out of the land, and then there is a partial return of the land. So those are the 12 Old Testament events. And then there's a period of about 400 years before the Messiah is born. And so in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, Jesus is born, the Messiah, and then he will be crucified on the cross, he will be buried, he will raise on the third day, and then 40 days later he will ascend to heaven. He will then, 10 days later, send the Holy Spirit, and that's the foundation, the beginning of the church. At the end of the church age, Jesus returns in the air and takes all living uh, believers and those who have already died to heaven to be with him. And then there's the seven years of the tribulation. Jesus then returns to the earth, establishes the kingdom for 1,000 years, the kingdom for 1,000 years, and then there is the great white throne judgment and the end of human history. All right, good deal. Everybody's doing well. So we have looked at the creation event, the fall, the flood, and tonight we're looking at uh, the Tower of Babel. With the creation, we looked at the uh, fact that God created everything and that there is a creator-creature distinction that is important. Romans 1 says that man rejected the knowledge of God that God revealed to them and made it manifest within them. But two things, it's evident from what he made and it is evident within them and they preferred to worship what? The creation rather than the, the creator. So that is a basic problem, but it begins, there's the creator-creature distinction. God is the ruler of his creation and the universe in Genesis 1. He created man in his image and likeness, male and female, both in the full image of God. And then he established three divine institutions, responsible choice, marriage, and family. Then there's the fall. The fall occurs because man wants to determine right and wrong for himself. And when the serpent tempted Eve, she disobeyed God, and then she gave to her husband, and he disobeyed, and that led to all the problems. So that's the fall. Man wants to be God, wants to determine right and wrong, wants to ter determine what uh, is the correct course of action. Because of sin, they're spiritually separated from God. Uh, the three divine institutions are all going to be marred. Uh, corrupted because of sin. So man, because he is, has a, uh, God has given us responsible choice because of sin, we make irresponsible choices. And uh, that affects marriages and it affects the way men and women relate to one another and it affects the family. And so we see the breakdown of the family just almost immediately as we have the first murder where Cain murders his brother Abel. And, but in the midst of all of that, and even as God is announcing the consequences of, um, the consequences of their sin, uh, he, there's the promise of the Savior who would 
um, who would be wounded on the heel by the seed of the serpent, but he would crush the head of the serpent. And then we went through the next chapters and how we saw generation after generation became more and more evil until I believe it's verse 9 of Genesis 6 that that the imagination of man's heart was evil continuously. So th there's this basic problem, and it's not the environment, it's not education, it's not money, it's nothing but the sin nature. Man is fallen and corrupt and a rebel at heart. And so by the time you get to after 2,000 years, then God decides to reboot reset history and every human being on the face of the earth with the exception of the eight in Noah's family uh, will be killed. Noah and his wife, his three sons and their three wives will survive on the ark. And so um, that, but God was gracious. And we know that probably for several hundred years, because it started not with Noah, but it started with Enoch, uh, who was preaching the grace of God. For several hundred years, grace preceded judgment, but the human race rejected that judgment. So we came to the end of the, uh, of the flood, and we looked last time at basically these first three headings, that the, the lifespans changed radically, and that um, uh, we looked at the, the bar graphs for the ages and that the first four generations after the flood still lived rather lengthy lives and then the next uh, five or six all died before the third and fourth generations from the flood died. And as a result of that, there was a tremendous loss of knowledge that was not passed, passed on. But we saw that these, uh, the foundation for these ancient civilizations, I think it was the first, um, first 12 dynasties of Egypt, would have been during the lifespan of the first four generations uh, following the flood. And we have example of Ice Age maps that survived uh, that were later copied in the Middle Ages, but it shows that they had some sort of much older maps that included maps of the coastline of South America, the coastline of Ant Antarctica without ice, the rivers, the rivers, the mountains were all present, and, um, and nobody knew what that was until we had uh, special satellite photographs that could uh, depict that, penetrate the ice cap in Antarctica, and lo and behold, these ancient maps uh, accurately depicted the mountain ranges, the valleys, the rivers uh, in Antarctica. So we come down to this next section dealing with the glo global amnesia. So there's going to be a repetition of the main task, which is to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. There's another rebellion against Yahweh. That leads to the, to that's the Tower of Babel. And there is a quest for fame. They want to make a name for themselves rather than glorify God. And so there will be the establishment of the fifth divine institution. The fourth was human government that was uh, part of the, no, the covenant with Noah, the Noahic covenant. And once God scatters the languages, uh, then it will be, um, uh, it will divide people up into various uh, tribal groups, clan, clans, tribal groups, and then eventually um, it will lead to the division of, of nations. And so we're going to look at that tonight and, um, and ask a couple of questions that they have in the curriculum. They have these boxed areas. The first question, first boxed area is, if God did not separate people by race, because it wasn't until after Babel you had different, what we would refer to maybe as ethnicities, um, so where does racism come from? Where does it derive? Uh, then we see that God is really using nations to limit evil. And that's hard for people to understand. I remember one of my seminary professors say, we have to understand that God is omniscient. That means that for every action, God knows what all of the consequences will be. So if God had left people with one language and left people with a one-world type of culture and government, 
uh, with all uh, that that would have produced certain consequences. And we know that by dividing people up into tribes and nations, there's just been horrible things that have happened all through history. There have been wars, and there have been uh, horrible things that have taken place. But God in his omniscience knew it would be worse to be, have a one-world government and one-world people than to have them divided up. Now, so a lot of people want to argue with God about that, maybe, but you have to trust that, that God is omniscient. And last time I looked, none of us even came close. So and then the next boxed area is what does Satan think about tribal diversity? He hates it. In fact, when he gets his ideal government, it will come in the tribulation and it will be a one world government. And he will have it ruled by his man who he will personally uh, possess. And we see this uh, all through scripture, this battle between Babylon, which is both literal and a figurative representative of the kingdom of man, versus Jerusalem, the city of God. Jerusalem often and sometimes imitates Babylon, like the city of man. And so then we'll end with a review of the divine institutions. And I want to say a little, few things about some of the evidence that survived uh, the flood and survived the scattering of the nations among the Chinese people. So we'll, we'll get to that. So here's our chart that traced out the ages. We see that Noah lived to be 950 years. He died around 2,000 years um, after creation. And then uh, he is outlived by his sons Shem, Arpaxad, uh, Shelah, and Eber. But when you get down to Peleg, who is one, two, three, four, five generations from him, Peleg only lives to be 239 years. Uh, his father lived 464 years, so the lifespan is cut almost in half. And everybody after, Pe after Peleg uh, has an extremely short lifespan. And many of, the, many of them die uh, before Shem, Harpaxad, Sheila, or Eber die. So that's when you have this loss of information. There is a forgetting about God. They forget, forget why there was a flood. And the basic reason is there's a breakdown in the marriage and a breakdown in the family. And so there's no passing on of the truth of God's word from one generation to another. And there is a willful, intentional amnesia. And so in this chart, we see that there would have been believing parents, you know, Ham, Shem, and Japheth and their wives. Maybe, maybe they did a good job with the first or second generation, but eventually there's a breakdown and the parents don't really do a good job of teaching or communicating the truth of God's word, the true history of, uh, of Genesis 1 through 11. And as a result, their children have a very weak belief and begin to drift, begin to, they don't really look at, re remember everything accurately, and so things begin to get distorted. And then the grandchildren of the believing parents uh, aren't taught anything, and they just... Uh, go into unbelief. And we see that so often today in our, own, in our own culture. We see so many Christian parents and grandparents and their, and their children just weren't very, um, very strong in the word and their grandchildren know almost nothing. And uh, there are lots of exceptions, thankfully, but there are many, many examples of that. I remember my very first church, which was down in Lamarck, Texas. I was so surprised. This was 40, 45 years ago. I was so surprised at the number of people in the church whose children had either married unbelievers or they had married those who went to very liberal churches or churches with extremely bad, uh, bad theology. And then their grandchildren just didn't go to church at all. And I was just shocked by that. I, I mean, it was drilled into me from the time by my parents as well as the church that you just, my mother especially, I didn't have any friends that weren't believers. I was the first thing, you've all heard me tell this story many times. I would come home and say, oh, I got met a new friend at school. The first thing she would say, I mean, I was six years old. Or, have they trusted Christ as their Savior? So by the time I was nine or ten, I knew that I had to witness to them and make sure they had the gospel they understood the gospel before I ever went home and said anything. And so by the time I became, I got to dating age, 
I knew that, that you know, I'm not going to come home and say, hey, there's this girl at school. I want to take her to the movie. My mother's going to ask me if she's saved, and I can't lie to her. You know, some mothers have radar on lies. So I guess a couple of you had mothers like that. All right, so God reasserted the task, which was for the human race to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And so there was a scattering of the people. And, and there are a lot of studies on this. You'd be amazed uh, how many uh, Christian anthropologists and sociologists and scientists, uh, I'm, I'm going, going back to three or 400 years, who have researched these things and written books. But, of course, our godless uh, teachers didn't know anything about them. You have to really dig it out. But there, is a, um, there's a, there was a sociologist named Arthur Custance. He was Canadian, and uh, he wrote a number of uh, books in the 50s and 60s, 70s too, I think. I think he died somewhere in the late 70s or early 80s. Uh, and they're bound together in several volumes, and they're called the Doorway Papers. Actually, you can, you can Google him or search him, and you can find a website that has all of his stuff, and you, all of his papers and everything, research everything. You can download it and read these things. But I think it was his third volume was called Noah's Three Sons. And he, it's, it's probably a 300, 400-page book, and he traces out what happens and the geographical names in places in Germany and places in Africa, places in Asia that go back and reflect the names of these descendants of Ham, Shem, and, and Japheth. And so we know that Japheth's family group um, went uh, mostly to the Northwest, but there's some, the uh, uh, Aryans, who, that Aryan is a form of the word Iran. The Persians, the Persians are Japhethites, they're Caucasians. And um, so some of Japheth's descendants went into Asia, but most of them went Northwest, and they went into the areas of um, of, uh, of Western Europe, of Eastern Europe, uh, uh, some uh, into uh, Russia, and uh, those areas. And then you have the descendants of Ham. These mostly went into the Middle East and into the Medi some of the Mediterranean, mostly Southern Mediterranean areas, and into Africa. But middle some others went east into Asia as well. And then you have the descendants of Shem, which are mostly the Arabs and the Jews and some others, and they were mostly in the Middle East and in, in Asia. So this sets the stage for the next big event that we're going to look at, which is, um, which is dealing with the Tower of Babel. And Josephus re records uh, a little bit about the Tower of Babel, and his view is that the Tower of Babel was built out of anger and resentment toward God that it was the belief that because God had punished the human race in this horrible, tragic catastrophe of the uh, Hebrew word was mabul. It's the only word, uh, it's the only thing it's used to describe is the flood of Noah. And that this was so horrible that down there, they were going to build, they were going to build this tower and they would be able to survive any, any other flood that God gave. Of course, see, they're rejecting revelation. They're rejecting the fact that God promised he wouldn't destroy the earth by water again and a, and a, a, a number of other things. And in uh, Genesis 11, 1, we're told, now the whole earth had one language and one speech. So they're not divided by language at all. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, so these would have been some of the uh, uh, descendants of, of Japheth and of Ham, primarily Ham. They, they journeyed from the, to, to Babel, to Shinar. That's another name for uh, where Babylon was. And they, and they, dwelt, they dwelt there. And so they, um, it is at that time that there is um, uh, the issue again becomes, are you going to obey God or not? Yahweh said what? Fill the earth. Well, there were others, as we saw back on this, this slide, there were others that did some scattering to some degree. But a large number of them disobeyed God, and they gathered together, built a city, 
and a kingdom, which we'll see in just a minute. And rather than doing what God said to fill the earth, man said, no, we're going to settle in one place and we're going to make a name for ourselves. See, making a name for yourselves is we want to have a reputation. We want to be somebody. We want to do something that is going to glorify who we are rather than glorifying God. So it comes back to that perennial issue. Are we going to submit to the authority of God and his revelation, or are we going to go out and do it our own way and do whatever seems right to us? Genesis 11.4, they express it this way. Uh, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Now, you you and I know, we know uh, how the earth is constructed, and we know how tall the atmosphere is, and, but they've lost, by this time, they've lost a great deal of that knowledge that those coming off the ark in the first four or five generations knew. So we're going to build this huge tower to the heavens, and uh, we're going to make a name for ourselves. We're going to glorify ourselves, lest, what? Lest we be scattered over the face of the whole earth. So see, that's in direct conflict to what God said, which was to multiply and fill the earth. So they're in direct uh, disobedience to God. So it is rebellion against uh, Yahweh. And uh, just like the the flood had destroyed all of the evil that was on the earth before, we see that this evil continues because it's uh, it's in the human heart. So they continue to be rebellious. They continue to disobey God. Now, the interesting thing that you should recognize, we'll get to this uh, in a, next time, but they wanted to make a name for themselves. But when you flip over, this is Genesis 11. When you go to chapter 12, when God calls Abraham, what is one part of the promise that he makes to Abraham? God says, I will make your name great. See, that's why it's important to do some of these broad overviews, not get so... Uh, focus on just details is that you've got to see how these uh, comparisons and contrasts work through the text of Scripture. God's making a point. The people had become extremely rebellious like they were before the flood. They want to glorify themselves. And so God is going to divide them with this judgment of uh, dividing their languages. And then he's going to call out Abraham. He says, I'm going to make your name great. So that's, that's the difference. So the issue, again, comes down to authority. Are we going to obey God, or are we going to obey, obey our own desires? So the divine viewpoint is that we are to obey God. He is the creator. We are under his authority. And uh, in spite of our rebellious inclinations from our sin nature, we are to submit to God's authority. Uh, when we are walking with the Lord on the basis of his word, then we understand that God is the one who defines right and wrong. He defines what we do. He defines the nature of everything. And um, that gives us a purpose, a meaning in life. And so people, people with a biblical worldview know that God is the ultimate authority, that God is in control of history, and God is the one who uh, guides and directs our life. He gives us meaning and purpose. He gives value to life. But people, on the other hand, who have rebelled against God and have a pagan worldview have little regard for life. They generally produce a culture of death. And uh, since October 7th, and I don't know how many videos you've seen or if you've had or read about all of the, all of the brutal things that were done and all of the, the ways in which bodies were uh, uh, just uh, desecrated, uh, chopped up, all of these other things that happened. One of the first things I thought of, because I am a, a lover of history, And I have read a lot about the history of North America, especially among the uh, uh, Indian tribes. A lot of people get a lot of confused ideas. Most of the Indian tribes that we are familiar with were in those locations and in those places less than 150 years. And there were many uh, incredible wars among among those, those Indians. And the way in which uh, the Hamas, the pagan Hamas, desecrated the bodies, uh, 
dismembering them, decapitating them, disemboweling them. Uh, that's nothing new compared to what the Aztecs were doing and what many of the uh, tribes in the Ohio River Valley did, what the Comanches did, and, and others. And so this is just what happens in paganism. You get away from God and you have this culture of death. And uh, it's just it's just absolutely horrific. And so uh, it degenerates. And that's what we're seeing today because people have turned their back on God in this rebellion against God. So the line where this seems to be most manifest, it's manifest in all three lines, but at the one of Ham... Uh, is the one that it descends to Nimrod. You have um, uh, Ham is the father of Cush. Cush is the father of Nimrod. Nimrod is the one who is a might, called a mighty hunter uh, before the Lord. But that could be understood to mean he's the mi- mighty hunter against the Lord. And in fact, uh, our good friend, Dr. Doug Petrovich, uh, Doug will be here probably have him come and stand in for me a couple of times in the spring, but he has a new book coming out on Nimrod. Uh, he identifies Nimrod, I believe it's with Sargon II of, uh, of Akkad. And so this is going to be coming, coming out soon. But this is who uh, Nimrod is, this uh, p- a powerful person who gathers people together to build this tower against God. Genesis 11.3, we see their statement come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. Now, you know, this asphalt is it's not really a, the petroleum product that we think of, but it was some, that something akin to, the, uh, to what Noah used to waterproof the ark. That's an important clue. What are they doing? They're building this tower and they're going to waterproof it so that they're protected from a flood. That's, that's what they're doing here. And they said in verse 4, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. Uh, they're in rebellion against God. Now Nimrod, his descent, his genealogy is given in Genesis 10, 8 through 11. Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. So he's powerful. He establishes a kingdom and he uh, defeats other groups. He's a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, he is antagonistic to Yahweh. And the beginning of his kingdom was, look at these uh, four cities, Babel, Erech, Akkad, Kalna in the land of Shinar. So this is where you know Babel will become Babylon. So this is the seat of the rebellion against God. And so Babylon becomes a literal place and it also represents the rebellion against God. All the way in, you get into Revelation into the, um, into the tribulation period and there is a reassertion of a kingdom of Babylon. I believe that is literal. The reason I believe it's literal, there's no place in the Bible where Babylon is ever used as anything other than describing the literal location, geographical location of, of Babylon. So they're motivated by a desire for personal glory over against God. And they do not want to submit to the authority of, of God in their uh, quest for fame. And what we have seen in this chart is that the creation was all good. That is normal. From the fall, we live in an abnormal world. People are abnormal. Everything is abnormal. It is not the way God intended it because everything has been corrupted by sin. And so you have the coexistence of good and evil uh, in human history. And this will go until the future judgment that occurs, a final judgment at the great white throne judgment. And that which is good, that which is godly, goes to heaven. And, is, and that which is evil, that has rebelled against God, is going to be confined and restricted to the lake of fire for all eternity. And God walls that off uh, in the future. and so finally solves the problem of evil. So we go back to Genesis 11, and the Lord came down. See, God isn't just, it's omniscient. He knows everything they've done. 
He knows every thought they've done. He knew what Nimrod was going to think billions of years in, in eternity past. But God demonstrates that if you're going to engage in judicial activity, you're going to come down and, and take a look at things and get an eyewitness account and know exactly what people are doing. So there's an evidence, evidentiary statement here. The Lord came down to see the city and tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one and they all have one language. That's the problem because they can really communicate with each other and get together and rebel against us. This is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. There's a potential in the uh, universality of the human race that if you have globalism, you have uh, internationalism, then what man can do is, is evil uh, to the nth power. And um, those of you who've never been to New York, I meant to grab the pictures and got away from me, but I went to the UN building. Over the entry to the UN building is the quote from Isaiah 2 that we will um, uh, beat our swords into pr our spears into pruning hooks and swords into plowshares. And that is a statement that Isaiah is, in the context, he's describing what the future messianic kingdom will be like. And so you have this is, is, is etched into the, uh, into the uh, brick over the entrance to the United Nations. They are, they, it is a visible statement. They, ha they have taken a messianic prerogative to themselves. It's a religious institution. And there are, there's a statue out in this opening uh, courtyard where there is a blacksmith beating a sword into a plowshare. And there are very other, various other statues to various Greek and Roman gods and goddesses. It is a very, very pagan environment. Uh, Genesis 11.8, the Lord scattered them abroad. How did he scatter them? He didn't just come along with a whisk broom and scatter them. God is, scatters them by confusing their language, verse 9, uh, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth and the Lord scattered them. Now, see, what, one of the things we have to do is recognize that, that God is a God of order. God is a God of planning. God is a God who... Uh, knows all of the knowable, right? He's not surprised by this. He knows what will happen. He knows what the consequences will be if he continues to allow things to go the way they've been going. But not only that, but God is the creator of every human being. God is crea the creator of human bodies. He's the creator of the genome. He is the creator of DNA. He is the creator of... Uh, all of the different elements that make up the genome, the, the things that give you a certain desire and liking for certain kinds of activities or foods or people. And even uh, among twins, there's some differences. They don't always, even identical twins, always, they're, they're much more prone to be alike, but there are, there are differences. And those differences are encoded within that, that DNA structure. So God, because he is omniscient, knows that these thousand people over here all have certain, um, certain trends in their genome, in their DNA. And so he's not just going to go eeny, meeny, miny, mo and just kind of pick out, I'm going to, and it's where it's pure sort of random chance and say, okay, I'm going to give you English and you Spanish and you French. He knows that there are certain physical characteristics as well as other char emotional and other characteristics. And so the people that have certain characteristics that are, have an affinity, he's going to give them French. And another group, they have a tendency towards having a, a, a little different skin tone. The uh, melanin's going to be a little different. There, there's going to trend toward a little bit more maybe yellow. And so they're going to become um, the progenitors of a lot of Asian people. 
and, and so on. So that God isn't just randomly throwing languages out there. He is specifically matching language with genetics and DNA and things like that so that down the road there will be certain traits that will come to the surface. And so some people will have very dark skin, other people who will have very light skin, some people will be light skin, blonde, blue eyed, others will be very dark skinned and dark eyed and things of that nature. But this, but they're all human beings. That's one of the things that, be, that has been uh, discovered as a result of a lot of the scientific research is that there, this idea of race that when you get down into the genetic coding in everybody, it's the same. There are just these, these little, some people have a little more uh, melanin, some people don't, their eyes are a little different, noses are a little different, that kind of thing. But they, the, the basics are all the same. And there's, there's no difference. So racism uh, becomes a consequence of the sin nature and the corruption that comes from human beings. So I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but that's, that's the essence of what happened. God intentionally divides all of the people according to their languages, not according to skin color. So everybody still looked the same. Everybody had the same um, uh, DNA and everything at, at that particular point. So we go back to our divine institutions because this is a divine institu new divine institution that gets established here. Somebody once asked me, well, how can you separate government from nations? It's real easy. Everybody, no matter, if, if you had everybody the same, they would still have government in terms of tribes and cl clans and whatever, but they really wouldn't be div divided up that much. It would be all part of the same thing. But when you get the division of languages, that's when you develop into what I would call biblical nations. Uh, biblical uh, tribal diversity is how it starts. Now, we live in a world there with nationalism, is said to be evil. Well, there are certain people who do evil things with anything that's good. But God is the one who established nations. And this is scattered throughout the scriptures. Remember, this is called interlock because you can't just take one part of scripture and pull it out uh, without the rest of scripture being hurt. So we have uh, passages in the Old Testament like Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. When the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations. When he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the people. See, borders are established by God. Borders are not established by people. God is the one who oversees all of these things. He separated the sons of Adam. He set the boundaries of the people according to the numbers of the children of Israel. So the, uh, there's, Israel is the centerpiece. We'll get to the Abrahamic covenant next time, or time after next. And that's, if you don't understand the Abrahamic covenant, you can't understand history at all. You can't have a meta-narrative of the correct meta-narrative of history, because everything goes back to the fact that God called out one special people through whom he would give his word, his revelation, and provide salvation and the Messiah. And that everything else is all controlled, governed by God, toward that particular end of being able to save as many people as possible. So all of human history is ultimately tied back to what God is doing uh, through Israel. And even though we had those articles I mentioned earlier that seem to be very negative and that, that it doesn't look good for Israel and Israel could be wiped off the face of the earth, we know it's not. We know that God is in control and God is the protector of Israel. And so we don't need to worry about stuff like that. Uh, God is going to take care of Israel, and it's going to be fun to watch. In Deuteronomy, or in addition to Deuteronomy 32.8, uh, Paul refers to this when he is at the Areopagus, uh, Mars Hill, right by the um, uh, Parthenon in Athens. And as part of his talk to these Athenian philosophers, he says, and he has made from one blood every nation. See, we're of one blood. It doesn't matter what the external skin color is or what, how the eyes are shaped or the cranium is shaped or anything else. 
That just, that's irrelevant. We're all made from one blood. We are one race, the human race. He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their nations. Now this is so, so very, very important uh, to understand this. In fact, and somehow it escaped me here. Um, for, fortunately, I have a Bible. We see a sa- similar kind of statement in, in Daniel chapter 2, verse 21. And it, this is after Daniel has uh, interpreted the giant statue that Nebuchadnezzar had seen and is going to, has interpreted this. And what Daniel says in, starting in verse 20, he says, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. Everything goes back to the omniscience of God and the omnipotence of God. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and he raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. So all of these talk about the sovereignty of God. He is the creator of all things and the overseer of human history. Now, we see this division that takes place. You have three groups of sons, uh, three groups of descendants based on the sons of Noah. In Genesis 10.5, you have the sons of Japheth. And in Genesis 10.5, it says, their descendants became the seafaring peoples, that spread out to various lands. And if you think about those seafaring charts that I showed you last week, uh, they, were, they were building ships and going all over the planet and scattering all over the planet. Uh, became the seafaring peoples that spread out to various lands, each identified by its own language, clan, and national entity. What's left out? Skin color. Okay? It's language. Language separated and then these separations develop different cultures. The differences are cultural. And cultural has to do with ideology. And all cultural differences that, real, that are, uh, I think, that are most distinctive are the ones that trace back to their rebellion against God and how it manifests. But that's a whole other issue. Genesis 10.20, Sons of Ham. These were the descendants of Ham identified by clan, language, territory, and national entity. Genesis 10.31, the sons of Shem. These were the descendants of Shem, identified by clan, language, territory, and national entity. So see, it's not about race. It's not about skin color. It's not about these other um, factors that are, that are irrelevant. It is the consequences developed because of language. And it's a whole other field of study, but, but my, my wife is completely bilingual. And she's made a great study of language. And one of the things that is, that is unique, and I've read this when I, talk, when I read uh, missionary stories as they're studying language. I've talked to various missionaries who are really uh, very much involved in translation work into other languages, is that there is an intimate co- connection between the culture of a people and the language. So people who are, let's say, for lack of a better term, more aboriginal, don't have a language that can handle technical things. That has to be introduced from somewhere else. So the language restricts them in in a lot of ways. And you also see that with theology because uh, my experience going to Africa, going to um, Eastern Europe, is that, that even though there's a Christian heritage in Eastern Europe, it doesn't have the theological precision in the language that you have in English. And so sometimes you get into some really, really amusing situations trying to deal with the translation because the Russian would be really bizarre. Okay, so we come to page 19 in the notes, and... Um, we ask the question, if God did not separate the people by race, uh, where did racism derive? Racism derived from the sin natures of the individual people who began to put down those who weren't like them and began to say things about people who weren't like them. And Genesis 9, 19, um, the whole earth came from the sons of Noah. 
So everybody in this room came from one of the three sons of Noah. We don't go back to Adam. We go back to Noah. And everybody comes back to, goes, goes back to Noah. So you have here, you have Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and then all the families of the world descended from them. So now in this chart, I'm combining the one I just looked at above, and this is evolution. Evolution says that some races are less evolved and less human. I remember the first time I really grasped this, I was at the Holocaust Museum here in Houston, and there was a sign there that says there, there are not multiple races, there's only the human race. And many of us have grown up using race in a different sense, but that's absolutely correct. And so it is evolutionary. Evolution teaches that some races are less evolved and less human. Other races are fully evolved and fully human. Guess which ones, according to Charles Darwin, guess which ones were fully evolved and fully human? The white European races. He was a racist down to his toenails. How do I know this? On the left, we have the original cover, title page, of The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection by Charles Darwin. Look at what the subtitle is. Preservation of Favored Races. The Bible doesn't know of plural races. Evolution knows of plural races, of favored races in the struggle for life. Notice what's missing from the cover of the 150th anniversary edition of Origin of Species. There's no reference to favored races anymore. That's not acceptable. But Darwin not only had a biological theory, from, but from that biological theory came a, a social theory of evolution. And it is so, it's called social Darwinism. And social Darwinism said that there are some human beings, because originally before the Holocaust, before World War II, they believed in, in polygenesis. And polygenesis, poly means many, that, that you had different places on the planet where evolution took place and produced uh, humano hominoids. And as a result of that, so you had like Peking man in Asia, and you had Neanderthal, and you had uh, Australopithecines down in Africa. And so you had multiple places where evolution took place and produced uh, different uh, humans. But see, they're different races of humans, so some are more evolved and some are less evolved. I mean, that, is, that just undergirds pure... Uh, pure, pure racism. And you see this today in the horrific racism of anti-Semitism. And uh, because uh, that, that was always there in anti-Semitism, but it got a scientific veneer. And so I have two uh, screenshots here. This is taken from a website. You ought to look at it if you're interested. It's called Memory. And I forget what that stands for, Middle Eastern something or other. But what they do is they have on their website a translation and transcript of every speech made by as many imams and Middle Eastern leaders as they possibly can. And so you can go in and you can see what they are actually saying in Arabic when they say something totally opposite in English for the Western press. And so here on the left, on the left you have um, an imam who is, um, he is a, a Middle Eastern, he says, and they, about the Jews, he says, they are indeed the descendants of apes and pigs. And on the right you have a Danish imam who calls the Jews the offspring of apes and pigs. So that is how, how they, th that's how they think. And so if you think that when, the next time you watch the news and you see all of these uh, pro-Hamas Palestinians out there demonstrating 4,000 people, painting hand, red hand prints and defacing our White House, and you see that taking place, I want you to realize that those people are living out a primary evolutionary presupposition and they, are, they believe to the bottom of their feet the Jews are the descendants of apes and peacocks, and it is their job to eradicate their existence from the face of the earth. 
And that's what they were trying to do on October 7th. That when you pay attention to the news reports and you listen to what's happening, you look at the primary footage, they were, it's just like what I've read dealing with the Comanches, dealing with the uh, uh, various, uh, uh, the Mohawk, Iroquois, other tribes up in the Northwest, the Shoshone, that they, they reveled, they lived to kill. They, they lived, they were at the height of their greatest existential experience by taking the life of a Jew. And the more they made a Jew suffer, the more excited and happy they were. They had reached their full meaning in life, and so now they can die. They did not care if it cost them their life if they were just able to take the life of a Jewish person. That's who we're dealing with. That's who we're dealing with. When you look at their politicians that are all cleaned up and whitewashed by the Western press, what's beneath the whitewash, what's beneath the suit are these beliefs. It is horrible. It is horrific. And it is just another manifestation of Satan's hatred for the Jewish people. It was manifested with the Nazis. I mean, this isn't hyperbole. I listened to an hour lecture by a, an Egyptian expat scholar, and she was absolutely brilliant today. And she scared me to death because of how she described all the tentacles of the Muslim Brotherhood in governments throughout the Middle East and in Western Europe. And she was not trying to be sensationalize it at all. She had facts and figures and names and everything. One of the, and I did not know this. I know that the top two books, the, the top, number one and number two bestsellers in all Muslim countries are the, um, the Protocols of Zion, which was a hoax, and it blames the Jews for everything. And the second one is Mein Kampf, Hitler's book, My Struggle. You could translate that into Arabic as My Jihad. One of the most popular names that is given to Arabs, Arab men, is Hitler. And other names from the Nazis. And, the, and it was the name of one of the second or third in command under Mubarak. I think it was his defense minister. That was his given first name, was Hitler. This is unbelievable, the, uh, the depths. And of course, I've taught on this in the past that the Mufti of Jerusalem spent several years during World War II uh, in Berlin with Hitler uh, and giving him more and more ideas of how he could uh, exterminate the Jewish people. And his name was um, Husseini, and uh, he was actually Arafat's uncle. But because he had, because of the connotations of of Husseini's name, uh, Arafat changed his name so that people wouldn't associate him with this virulent anti-Semite who was the Mufti of Jerusalem. So the question comes up with Darwinism: Is who's human? You have people of different skin color. Are they all human, or is there higher forms of humanity? God used nations to limit evil. If you have all the nations in one boat and people start gravitating towards evil, there's no way to control it. But if you're on the second boat and you have all these compartments uh, that are limited by language, then it limits the spread of, of evil. It is one way that God used to restrain evil. We talked about the divine institutions before that the three before the fall were designed to promote prosperity and growth a, a, among the human race in perfect environment. But after the flood, uh, uh, nation, uh, government and nation were designed to restrain uh, evil and to protect us from the growth of evil. Genesis 9.25, when uh, Noah curses uh, his grandson Canaan. He says, curse would be Canaan. He doesn't curse the Hamites. He doesn't say anything positive or negative about the, descendant, the other descendants of Ham. But he knew something about Canaan that would be, that because of divine insight, because Noah was a prophet, that he is prophesying uh, th about Canaan because the Jews are going to have to go in and eradicate the Canaanites because they become so evil. 
and this is that Cain, Canaan would, would be punished in order to protect the rest of the human race. So you have, that was one of the purpose for nations, so that nations that were righteous could restrain the evil of those who were un, unrighteous. Acts 7, 26 and 27 again, God has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. He raises up nations and he takes down nations. And he does it for a purpose. This, well, what's, the, what's his governing principle? So that they should seek the Lord. He's trying to restrain evil for the purpose of the expansion of the gospel. So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grow for him, that they might look for him, that they might try to reach out and find something in their darkness. The issue is God wants to reconcile man to himself. 2 Corinthians 5.18, Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them because Christ was going to pay the penalty for them. And has committed to us the word, the message of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. We, that's our job, is we are ambassadors for Christ to represent him to the unbelieving world. That's our mission. And we are to plead, we implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We then as workers, together with him, also plead you, plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So God, who has been offended, has been reconciled by the work of Christ on the cross. So what does Satan think about this tribal diversity? 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 tells us that he blinds the mind of unbelievers, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Satan's plan is globalism and one world government. And this will be manifest in that person they call the Antichrist. He's also called the first beast in Revelation, and he is the prince who is to come in Daniel chapter 9. It was granted to him, the Antichrist, the first beast to make war with the saints and to overcome them. He will murder millions of Christians in the period of the tribulation. Not church age believers, but tribulation believers. We will be with the Lord in heaven by then. And authority was given to him, given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. He will unite the world in his, uh, in his empire. So here we see the apparent victory of Babylon, the evil world system, the kingdom of man over Jerusalem. But it is Christ who returns, and he will rescue the Jews who have their backs against the wall when they are in, um, in the area of Basra, down by Petra. They have escaped because they heard Jesus say, when you see the abomination of desolation, flee to the mountains. And those believers did that, and they will then call upon the name of the Lord. So these are the divine institutions. But we have seen that the problem isn't culture, uh, well, isn't, isn't, um, the problem isn't our environment, the problem isn't education, the problem isn't something external, it is in us, it's evil. The first human cu couple was created without sin or evil in a sinless world, but they chose to make their own decisions apart from God and to be their own God, and the result was sin and evil changed everything in the universe. The first family, their children were born with a sin nature. You have the first murder and later other murders. You have the development of Bilamic with uh, polygamy, the rejection of God's design uh, for marriage, the uh, second divine institution, 
third divine institution, families collapse till you get to, and I said Genesis 6, 9 earlier, Genesis 6, 5, man's heart was evil continually. That is a really strong, strong statement. So we have God's reset, and there's only eight that survived. The rest failed because of sin. Then after the flood, humans continue their rebellion against God. There is another failure at the Tower of Babel. God has to institute another divine institution to strengthen um, the human race against evil. So we see in this slide how civilization became paganized and how God intervened. With Noah and his family, everyone that got off the ark were believers. But several generations later, most people were following the lust of the flesh, their sin nature. They rejected God's history and truth and began to develop the kingdom of man, which was based on works and that man would save himself through his own ideas. In contrast, when we come back in two weeks, next week's kind of a review, and we're going to talk about a few other things that we need to clean up. Uh, God intervenes to preserve his history and truth, calls out Abraham, and uh, begins to establish this alternate counterculture uh, kingdom. So uh, then we get into this section on how civilizations become paganized, but retain elements of the knowledge of God. So the handout I gave you uh, is a handout uh, that gives this uh, poem that was translated. It is the story, the origin myth of a group of people called the um, uh, Mio, I believe. Let me get to the page in my notes to make sure I've got this right. all the way down here. This is a group of people that came and migrated into uh, the Miao people. This is from an article that was in the uh, Institute for Creation Research Acts and Facts uh, back in the early 90s. And uh, so a missionary and the, the information, bibliographic information for this is going to be posted on the description of this class. And so this, this, when the missionaries would go, typically when you have missionaries there, missionaries were with the China Inland Mission, and others, all the same procedure, they would learn the language of the, of, the, of the people. And in learning the language of the people, they would ask them questions, well, where did you come from? What is your history? What's your background? How, wh how do you understand your creation and things of that nature? And so they would be told that information in the language, of course, in the language of those people. And so this one missionary who worked with the uh, Miao people uh, for many, many years translated their origin story. And notice how much of biblical truth is preserved here. But there are some significant differences. And you can go all over the world. And I've mentioned before um, Wilhelm Schmidt, who was a German Jesuit priest, anthropologist, who went through every single religion in the world and traced their ultimate, uh, ultimate beginning to a monotheistic religion. Six volumes in the French, a bridge down to one in English. Uh, you're not going to find anybody in any sociology department in any, any university in this country who knows anything about it. I have a copy in my library of his uh, Xerox copy I made of his uh, abridged version. I mean, it's, it's remarkable the level of research there. But this is the Miao people. On the day God created the heavens and earth, on that day he opened the gateway of light. See, what's the first thing that happens? The earth is covered in darkness. God created light, separated the light from the darkness. In the earth he made heaps of earth and of stone. In the sky he made bodies, the sun and the moon. On the earth he created the hawk and the kite. In the water he created the lobster and the fish. In the wilderness, he made the tiger and bear, made verdure to cover the mountains, made forest extend with the ranges, made the light green cane, made the rank bamboo. God created everything. Then he talks about man. On the earth, he created a man from the dirt. What was Adam's name? Adam. What does it mean? Earth, land, Adama, from the ground. On the earth he created a man from the dirt of the man thus created a woman. No, from the man he creates a woman. How about that? Then the patriarch dirt. 
So in, for them, it's not Adam, it's dirt, which is a good translation of Adam. Then the patriarch dirt made a balance of stones. He estimated the weight of the earth to the bottom, uh, calculated the bulk of the heavenly bodies, and pondered the ways of the deity God. Deity God, God the patriarch dirt begat patriarch Sete. Who was, you have Cain and Abel. Who's the next son? Seth. And uh, he has, uh, he begets Sete. Patriarch Seta begets a son, uh, Lusu. Um, I don't have the list in front of me. I'm not sure who that relates to. And then Lama, Lamech. And then Nua, Noah. His wife was the matriarch, Gabaluan. Their sons were, notice, remember, biblically, Ham, Shem, Japheth. Their sons were Lohan, Loshen, Yahu. Same names. You know, we, we take a name like John in English, and you have Juan in Spanish, and Johan in, um, in, in German, and Ivan, Ivan, Ivan in, in Russian. But it's all the same name. So here we have the same names. Han is Ham, Shen is Shem, and Yahu is Japheth. So the earth began filling with tribes and with families. Creation was shared by the clans and the people. Um, these did not God's will nor returned his affection. Uh-oh, they're rebellious. But fall with each other, defying the Godhead. Notice, Godhead, he puts it. Uh, their leaders shook fists in the face of the mighty. Then the earth was convulsed to the depth of the three, st of three strata. The Bible says the fountains of the deep burst forth. Uh, rending the air to the uttermost heaven, God's anger arose till his being was changed. His wrath flaring up filled his eyes and his face until he must come and demolish humanity, come and destroy a whole world full of people. The flood he describes, I've got two slides here, but it, it, it rained how many days? Forty days in sheets and in torrents, then 55 days of misting and drizzle. The waters surmounted the mountains and ranges. The deluge ascending left a valley and hollow uh, on earth with no earth upon which to take refuge. Amazing. Goes on, talks about how just that family of Noah survives. Animals were with him, male and female. Birds were along, mated in pairs. Then Noah re liberated a dove, dove from their refuge and sent a bird to go forth and bring again tidings. And finally they found land where they could reside. Babel, he says, Lohan, that's Ham, then begot Kusa, Cush, and Mese. Um, so in, uh, in Ham's descendants, the Bible calls them Cush, Mitzraim, and uh, in Miao, it's Kusa and Mese. Mese is Misraim. Misraim is a name for Egypt. Uh, Lo Loshan begat uh, Elon and Nagashur. So in the Bible, Shem's descendants are Elam and Asher. Uh, Miao calls them Elon and Nagashur. So uh, fascinating to go through this. And you get the genealogy, the patriarch Japheth, Jafu, got the center of nations. And uh, so this is the tracing of the uh, ancestry from Japheth and then the patriarch Gomen, who's Gomer in the list, and on, on down. So isn't that interesting? So this survived. It, it goes back to dark antiquity. It was, uh, it was they, they recited this to this uh, missionary, and he lear had learned the language and translated it into English. But it didn't begin then. That was in the early 19th century. Uh, and then his, after he died, his wife uh, gave permission for um, ICR to, uh, uh, to print this. Then you have evidence that is in your notes. You can, you can read this. I'm not, I don't have time now to go through all of this, but this is fascinating how various words in, in the pictograms of Chinese. For example, on the left, the green is uh, to create. It's a combination of the symbol for dust, the symbol for breath or mouth, which indicates a person, and the breath of life. And so by putting those together, you get the word to create. And uh, then you have the various forms for to talk and to walk, and that refers to a living 
to a living creature. So there are several examples they put in there for happiness as a combination of one, uh, one person, one mouth, uh, in the garden of God. That was happiness. And then to come uh, is one form. There's one person plus another person, and then there's a tree. And what happens when God shows up in Genesis 3.9, he says, where are you? Come out, come out, wherever you are. And so it's a combination here of two people in a tree, hiding behind the tree. And then the word for boat is made up of three different components, uh, the, a basic uh, a vessel, and then uh, the n- uh, symbol for eight people, and, um, eight, and then eight and then people. So they're all in a boat. What the most fascinating one is the pictogram for righteousness, where you have the pictogram of a lamb put on top of a, the symbol for me, for an individual. Righteousness is when I am covered by a lamb. Where'd that come from in Chinese history? Fascinating stuff. This is not the kind of stuff that you're taught. I wouldn't even talk. I saw a little bit of this I heard from one professor in seminary. But there's a whole book on this, and so the titles for that are all on the description for this lesson so that you can go out and you can buy uh, the books that have all this evidence in them, and you can do that research on your own, okay? Let's uh, bow our heads. Father, thank you for this time that we've had to look at this, the evidence that's all around the history of the world that goes back, and there are these um, reminders of creation, of the flood, of the survival of Noah. Almost every civilization can trace back into antiquity some flood story, some discovery, uh, survival of, um, of uh, one man and his family. So, Father, we pray that this would strengthen our faith, our understanding of Scripture, as we continue to study and understand what you've revealed to us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.